Hey, Dad. So, uh, let's start uh, the presentation. This will be a, a, an introduction about uh, the European VLBI network and uh, how we do uh, science uh, with the EVN and uh, about the data reduction steps in uh, preparation of the tutorial later. So, the European VLBI network uh, has a number of great telescopes in Europe and uh, other parts of the world, uh, including South Africa, Russia, uh, uh, China. And this is a very sensitive uh, uh, standalone uh, VLBI array to image the sky at milliard second uh, uh, scale resolution. So, one of the most sensitive VLBI uh, networks uh, in the world. We do observations, uh, three uh, sessions uh, a year, where we uh, record the data uh, on disks, and then later these data are uh, shipped uh, uh, to the central data processor at Jive uh, in the Netherlands, where the data will be uh, combined. We also have real-time uh, EVLBI sessions, when uh, the data are uh, immediately uh, transferred through optical fibers uh, to the correlated jive and correlated real time. This is uh, the correlator itself, a jive, the central data processor. Uh, all the data come in here uh, eventually, and uh, this is the place uh, where the data from the various uh, telescopes are combined and uh, integrated, and then later processed and put in the archive. So there were uh, important developments in the past uh, decade here. Now we are running uh, the so-called EVN software uh, correlator, which is very flexible in operation. It has a lot of uh, interesting uh, uh, science modes. Uh, with besides the real-time EVLBI correlation, we can do continuum, spectra, uh, spectral line, pulsar binning, uh, projects, fast transients, and multiple phase centers. Uh, for large uh, field of views. We recently published uh, what we call an EVM vision document. It has a much longer title, in fact, VLBI 2030, a scientific roadmap for the next decade. Uh, in this book, uh, we uh, collected all the science uh, that the EVM does and can do uh, in the next, uh, in the uh, coming 10 uh, years. And uh, we also collected the ideas of, of uh, how to improve and what is it that needs to be done uh, to improve the EVN. The technological roadmap was based uh, on, on the science uh, requirements, and this is uh, uh, how the, the EVN will uh, evolve in the future. In principle, uh, we are uh, uh, planning a broadband EVN where we record a much larger bandwidth. And this way, we will be able to do spectral index imaging, but also we will be more sensitive for continuum projects. So this effort was funded by the Jumping Jive project work package 7, and the book itself you can download from archive. You see the URL below. So how uh, the science with the EVN uh, has changed in the past uh, decades, VLBI is already technical, uh, more than 50 years old. Now this, uh, what you see here is the uh, citations to EVN-related uh, papers. Uh, we have to say that with the globalization of astronomy, now uh, nowadays, there are more and more papers that are not only VLBI, but in combination with, uh, with other instruments. In, and this certainly uh, made an impact on, uh, on, on the EVN-related uh, papers as well, because uh, we are getting much more visibility and, and citations uh, this way. If we look at the science areas, then uh, we can see how uh, this is distributed between galactic, extragalactic science, you know, we do uh, cosmology, uh, we do uh, stellar astronomy, we do transients, AGN, uh, and uh, uh, galaxies. 
Now, formerly it was very much dominated uh, by Asian science, but uh, these uh, days it is much more equally distributed uh, the observation time uh, between stellar uh, and extragalactic, uh, between AGN, transients, uh, and so on. We are broadening, uh, therefore, the science scope of the EVN, but there is still a lot to do uh, to exploit the synergies uh, between uh, other facilities like the SK, the EHT, and uh, other instruments. Just uh, an example of uh, fantastic EVN science uh, we can do. Uh, this, is, this shows the localization uh, of a fast radio burst source uh, to a spiral galaxy. This is the second source uh, that was uh, uh, localized with uh, milliard second uh, accuracy with the EVN. The first one was also, the very, uh, the very first FRB uh, localized was also by the EVN. So these are uh, uh, quite mysterious signals, uh, fast radio bursts uh, that, that are active only uh, for a, a few uh, milliseconds and their origin is, is still not clear, but now we are uh, starting to collect the data and start to understand better what kind of sources may produce these very energetic but very short signals and, and accurate localization is extremely uh, important uh, in this sense because this is uh, the way uh, to find out you know the, their host galaxies and with the precision of, of the EVN not only uh, their host galaxies but even uh, the location within the host galaxy uh, can be uh, pinpointed and this way we can narrow down uh, the possible progenitors. So this is really one of the most important science cases, for example, for the SK as well, the square kilometer early. So in, in this sense, we are, we are already doing uh, SK science today with the EVM. This is another uh, uh, science example, Whitefield VLBI. Now, uh, you, you have to know that uh, with VLBI, we have very, very good resolution due to the long uh, baselines available uh, for VLBI. But when uh, we are working with the data, as you will see, we normally do some averaging in frequency and time. And what happens then is that uh, the field of view of, uh, will be very narrow. And we, it, this means that we see only a very, very small portion of the sky. Now, how to uh, improve on that? Uh, if you don't average uh, in frequency and time, you, ha you have uh, terabyte data sets. It's really hard uh, to work with those. But now with the SFX correlator, what we can do, uh, we can, uh, uh, ev uh, without averaging the data, just correlate uh, the full field of view of the observations. And then uh, we can shift the data uh, to uh, certain positions of the sky and we do some averaging on, at these positions. This is called multi-phase uh, center uh, correlation and within a single ob observation you can probe like hundreds of, of phase centers, hundreds of, of, of uh, targets this way. And then uh, surveying uh, uh, the sky is much uh, easier. Uh, with this technique. We could talk about uh, EVN science more, but uh, let's talk about how to do EVN science instead. So this shows a simplified workflow uh, for doing science with the EVN. First of all, you have a science idea. Then you have to write a proposal. You have to write down your idea, and this will be evaluated by the EVN program committee. And they decide whether uh, this idea is worth of uh, realization or not. And uh, if uh, there is support from the program committee, then the observations may be scheduled. Then uh, the observations happen either uh, in one of the regular sessions or uh, using real-time EVLBI in one of the EVN sessions. And 
if it's done real time, then the correlation happens immediately. Otherwise, uh, the correlation will happen later at chive. The data after some initial uh, processing uh, will go to the EVN archive where the users can download it from, they calibrate their data, reduce their data, and then comes the exciting part, uh, analyzing the data, writing it down, and uh, publishing. And please don't forget to acknowledge EVN and Jive when you write your science papers. Now, the time scale for this is, is usually quite long because uh, from your first idea, well, it takes uh, a few weeks to write the proposal, it takes a few weeks, months to, for the evaluation, and then a few months later it will be observed. So it can take a year or, or even years from the first idea to, uh, to publication. It is possible to accelerate this uh, process a bit. For example, for students, the projects are usually favorably judged by the by the PC and they can be these projects can be brought forward in the correlation queue as well or uh, you, you can also propose target of opportunity uh, projects for example for for transient sources that cannot wait and then from the proposal to data is a much uh, shorter time scale but let's talk about why VLBI is special. So most of you uh, probably already know a little bit about radio astronomy and how to do uh, science with the connected element interferometers. Now VLBI is a bit different in a sense that the data are recorded separately uh, at, uh, at the telescopes and and you don't, well, you don't have your data immediately, uh, the, the recorded data go to a correlator first where the signals are combined. Now, uh, because the stations are so far apart, there is a significant delay between a, a signal, the arrival time from one telescope to the other. Well, this is there for, for uh, connected element interferometers as well, but the effect is very small. With VLBI, the effect is so large that the phase of the signal uh, differs sub substantially as uh, you look at uh, the, the visibility phase uh, with frequency. Even within narrow subbands of a few megahertz, you see that the phases are wrapping quickly. If you, if you look at the data uh, to the right, uh, in the top panel, you see uh, very uh, rapid phase variations. Now, if you want to work with this data, and usually uh, that includes some averaging, then uh, you lose uh, data due to the correlation because you uh, average the data incoherently. So first of all, you have to uh, correct for, for this delay and uh, it's time derivative, the rate. And this process is called fringe fitting, which is very important in VLVI. And VLBI is also a bit more complicated uh, uh, than uh, other arrays because uh, usually we have a smaller number of telescopes available and our UV plane is not completely filled. So sometimes you have a lot of telescopes on shorter spacings and a few with uh, very long spacings. And then uh, with this kind of UV sampling, when you uh, produce your initial map, uh, your dirty map, then you will see very strong side lobes. So your dirty map will be really dirty. And it complicates, uh, uh, of course, imaging a bit, especially if uh, some of the telescopes have uh, certain calibration issues as well. So for users who are not really experienced with VLBI, they will need a lot of help to, uh, to be able to work with this kind of data.
But that's what, what we do in, in, in Jive. Uh, we help users to work with their data. So we have a, a few uh, very well-trained support scientists at our institute, and they do a lot of work, which I will not uh, explain everything here, but just to show you the range of activities. So they uh, support the correlation of the data, they support the observations uh, of the EVN, they support uh, uh, the users of the EVN, and uh, beyond all this, they do some science as well. Now, uh, the support is there for almost all steps of this uh, EVN science workflow. So if you have a science idea, but uh, you are not sure if it, this is feasibility to do with the EVN, you can uh, talk to Jive uh, support scientists. So there are certain tools you can use uh, to find out if the observations can be done with the EVN or not. For propos proposal writing, you can also ask for help. Uh, you can check if the requested array uh, is good uh, the ob observing strategy, uh, is good uh, what correlation parameters you need, we can, we can help uh, with that. We will not uh, write uh, the science justification for you, that is your job. Scheduling the observations, we will always uh, check every single schedule uh, the users make, it's in principle, your responsibility uh, to prepare uh, the VLBI schedule, but there is, there is uh, some help available. And especially if you are uh, requesting observations for uh, EVLBI, real-time correlation, then usually those uh, schedules are made by the support scientist. Now the observation and correlation, these things are done for you, you have to do nothing. And uh, our people at Jive help uh, the network in, in checking the data, doing fringe tests, and so on. And, and the observatories uh, carry out the observations. And the data are correlated. Uh, we contact you uh, to ask for correlation parameters. And the files are prepared, calibration metadata are prepared, a, a data calibration pipeline is run, and all this is archived in the EVN archive. For the data reduction, uh, this is your job, but again, help is uh, available. We can do this either online, or uh, if you can visit Jive, then you are very welcome to come, and uh, that's probably the best way for, for uh, new users to learn uh, how to do EVN data calibration. So, you have an idea, you want to do some science. What do you have to know if it's good enough? First of all, uh, you need to have a very well-defined uh, science question, science questions uh, that the observations will actually answer. So you have to explain this in the proposal. But, important things to check. First of all, your target source, will it be visible for arrays in the Northern Hemisphere? Sources with uh, uh, negative declination below minus 20 something, uh, they will not be uh, visible. Do you know the source coordinates accurately enough? Well, uh, typically we require that the coordinates are known better than arc second. You can still do observations if, if, if the, the errors are larger, but uh, you have to understand the complications uh, with that. Question, another question is, uh, do you really need milliarc second resolution to achieve the science goals? Or is it enough uh, if you just uh, use eMerlin or the VLA instead, for example? Does your target source have structure uh, in the milliarc second, hundred milliarc second uh, uh, 
scale range so uh, you can detect an image. Was the source observed before? Maybe, maybe you can find the data for this source in the EVN archive or other archives uh, that, uh, that will help you answering your science questions. Do you have an observing strategy? You know, the, the required array, frequency, what kind of UV coverage you, uh, you need, and what kind of sensitivity uh, you have to achieve. Do you have a calibration strategy? Do you need phase referencing or not? Uh, do you have a suitable list of amplitude or polarization uh, calibrators if you need polarizations as well, for example? And do you have a correlation strategy? Do you understand what kind of field of view you need and what parameters you need, uh, correlation parameters you need to achieve that? Or do you have multiple sources in the same field of view you are interested in? Would your project benefit from real-time EVLPI correlation or, or the standard sessions uh, would be uh, sufficient for your goals? So in all these questions, of course, we, uh, we help answering them. Just uh, write to user support at jive.eu and uh, as much as, as we can, uh, we will help you putting uh, together the proposal. But the, sci the science justification is, is your responsibility. If you have all this, you submit your proposal. If you want to know uh, when uh, there is a proposal deadline, then please uh, sign up for, uh, for the VLBI Explorers where you will uh, get notification. Also, you can regularly check the EVM web pages. We have deadlines uh, 1st of February, 1st of June, and 1st of October. But as I mentioned, you can uh, submit target of opportunity proposals as well any time during the year if they are justified. Normally the proposals are submitted through the North Star uh, tool, uh, but please uh, go and make an account in advance uh, because you will need an account to, uh, to submit a proposal. So there are various tools uh, that can be used. Uh, a very simple, very easy to use tool uh, is the EVN calculator. If you select an observing array, observing frequency, then it will uh, tell you for a certain integration time what kind of sensitivity you can achieve. And, and with that, uh, you will know that whether your target source is in principle uh, observable if it's compact enough, uh, the sensitivity will be enough for detection or not. Of course, uh, you must understand that, uh, for example, you have a, a source that was observed with the GMRT before. Uh, it has a certain flux density. It, may, it was maybe observed at different frequency. You must un understand the spectral index, but it was also observed at different resolution. So when you go to milliard second resolutions, you can uh, resolve out uh, the source as well. And, and uh, you should remember uh, that this, this can be a problem for the observations too. So we, we usually like to observe sources that at least uh, have a good chance uh, of detection uh, with VLPI. Uh, there is uh, another uh, new tool that is uh, uh, very uh, interesting, uh, that is the EVN Observation Planner. And this does much more than the calculator. It, it's a bit uh, more complicated, but uh, there are two modes uh, of this. There's a guided mode for beginners and there's a manual mode for experts. And I believe that uh, in one of the tutorials, uh, this tool will be uh, shown to you. Now, as I mentioned, after the correlation, uh, all the projects, all the experiments uh, are archived in the EVN archive, and then you can go and download your data. Normally, for one year, 
uh, it's only yours only you have the right uh, to download your data but after one year or for target of opportunities after half year the data will be public but this means that all the data that were uh, observed earlier are already public and in principle you have access to them and there is a warning that we are in a transitional period because uh, for a long time uh, we have used the APES package and the APES Parcelton uh, uh, pipeline uh, to reuse the data and to, uh, to provide uh, uh, the pipeline calibration files. However, we are moving over to a CASA-based solution and in these schools, uh, uh, the tutorials are also in CASA. So uh, this is a transitional period. The, the old system is APES and now we are moving over to CASA and soon everything will be available for you in CASA notebooks. There is the EVM data reduction guide. Uh, you can find it in the EVM web pages. This is a, a very useful uh, resource uh, if you want to know, uh, if you want to remind yourself about the steps of the data reduction, you should certainly go there. And uh, the current solution is really, really great because on the left side, uh, you have uh, the steps uh, explained uh, what to do in apes, while on the right side, the equivalent steps, more or less equivalent steps, what you have to do in CASA. So depending on, on, on the software package you use, you can find uh, uh, the answers in, here for, for both uh, cases. Now, of course, uh, our people uh, are available uh, to help you uh, every time. And these are some of the uh, former and current uh, support scientists at, at Jive. And we are uh, doing uh, uh, trainings as well. And uh, uh, we are uh, involved uh, especially in uh, uh, training uh, for new users in Africa, the new SK generation. And as I mentioned before, we welcome uh, all users at Jive uh, where uh, they can uh, learn how to uh, reduce their data and, and they can even participate during the real-time EVLBI observations. So this page uh, will have to be updated soon, but uh, for, uh, uh, for EVN users, there is, there is a way to get uh, support to come to Jive and use uh, their data. Now we are uh, moving uh, over to uh, the data of the uh, tutorial itself. Uh, from, uh, for this part, I have to mention that uh, uh, the slides are based on uh, uh, Jet, uh, Jack Rad Radcliffe's uh, uh, previous uh, uh, data slides uh, and uh, I believe uh, you will follow uh, the, the same steps uh, for the, the tutorial of uh, this data school as well. The data uh, were recorded in N14C3 this is a network monitoring experiment. And this is not a, 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 a user data set. This was not evaluated by the PC. So this, this was organized by the, uh, the Jive uh, support scientists uh, to, to monitor the uh, EVM performance. But this is a, a very good data set uh, uh, for the school because usually in, in network monitoring experiments, we always observe a few hours bright and compact sources and this is uh, uh, this way we can we can check uh, the performance uh, of the array so what is uh, data reduction as i mentioned we we calibrate the data and then and then we do some averaging uh, in time and frequency this is to bring down the data set to a, a manageable size for most uh, uh, per, uh, applications we can do this but uh, I have to say that of course when you are in, interested in a large field of use then uh, 
averaging uh, is not uh, possible because then you will, you will lose a lot of data and, and you will reuse your field of view as well. The observations uh, happened uh, you know, uh, 22nd of October 2014 for C hours. It was, uh, it was observed in the C band, uh, which is uh, 5 uh, gigahertz. This is a, a, a frequency where uh, the array is very sensitive and uh, uh, it is also uh, good because the, the atmosphere is uh, uh, transparent and uh, uh, there's not much uh, uh, complication uh, with the data. So this is really a sweet uh, spot for, for uh, VLBI observing. There were 12 uh, antennas used uh, in the observations. They are uh, highlighted uh, on the right hand side. Uh, you see uh, the antennas uh, with their uh, size indicated as well. The data were, uh, were uh, recorded on disk in session 3. Uh, we also have uh, the sensitivities uh, and measure the system temperatures that come with the data. And, and these are needed uh, to calibrate uh, the amplitudes to set the flux scale for the observations. Together with the gain curves, which uh, uh, tell us the elevation uh, depend, uh, dependence of, of the sensitivity uh, for each telescope. The data were uh, correlated at, at Jive and, and uh, the resulting fits files were, and the calibration data were put in the archive. So how uh, the observations were done, I mentioned already that uh, Nice, nice bright uh, compact sources were observed. These uh, bright sources uh, can be used as fringe finders, phase calibrators, amplitude calibrators. Uh, usually uh, this de depends on, on the use of the, of the cal calibrator, but, but usually a fringe finder is, uh, is you know, the brightest source and, and it with that, uh, even the, the slightest uh, errors you can easily see in the data, these very uh, bright finch finder sources and at, at, at the starting step, the steps of calibration, uh, correlation, uh, these are useful to, uh, to find the initial delays uh, on, on baselines. Phase calibrators, so these are usually uh, located close to target source, uh, they are still relatively uh, bright and uh, as compact as possible. They are uh, within a few uh, degrees of the target source and we use these sources to provide uh, uh, solutions uh, uh, for, for much weaker sources uh, that we cannot uh, fringe with ourselves. So we measure the residual fringe delay rate and phase uh, of these calibrators uh, regularly on a time scale of every few minutes. So it, it must be within the coherence time and uh, apply the solutions to, to the target. This way we, we uh, make sure that uh, there are no uh, coherence losses on the target. Amplitude calibrators uh, these are usually the most uh, compact sources. Uh, we, in principle, want sources that are uh, not very resolved, even on the longest uh, baselines. There is very, very little dependence of, of observed uh, correlation amplitude with, uh, with UV distances. And if you look at a source like that, it's, it's very easy to see if uh, certain antennas have... Uh, uh, amplitude calibration uh, problems. Uh, we have to uh, remind ourselves that uh, in VLBI there is no uh, such thing as an absolute uh, flux density calibrator uh, and we, uh, we only know the, the flux uh, scale of our observation to something like 10-15%. 10, 10, uh, 
The problem with the, uh, with the flux cal calibrators in VLBI that all sources that are compact enough for VLBI, they are variable. So they, they cannot be used as uh, absolute flux calibrators. So uh, this just shows you the four sources that were uh, observed. Uh, in this network monitoring experiment and I believe the, the primary goal of the tutorial will be to image the 3C, 345, J1640 pair uh, that are quite uh, close to each other so you can uh, phase reference uh, uh, one source uh, uh, to the other uh, in this experiment. So how the correlation was done? It was done at, at Jive using the SFXC uh, correlator. There was an initial clock searching period. Normally when the data come in, uh, there is a very significant delay uh, between the data streams. And, uh, and when, when if you combine the data uh, with this large delay, then you, you will have correlation losses. So this, this delay at this stage is, is usually uh, dominated by clock errors. That's why uh, this initial step of, of correcting for the delays is called clock searching. So we, we just normally use uh, fringe finder scans a few and then and then find these clock errors. Uh, when these uh, errors are removed, then uh, the correlation is done. So this is a uh, process of coherently combining data uh, for the telescopes and this, uh, forming the the baselines and we do this with uh, a time averaging of one two seconds and typical frequency resolution of half to one megahertz per channel uh, per uh, spectral uh, channel for continuum experiments of course uh, for large field of view experiments or for example for fast transients or for spectral line projects you can use much finer time and, uh, and frequency resolution. And the delays uh, uh, that are still in the data uh, can be um, due to unknown, well, not very well known source coordinates or, or errors in the telescope positions or errors uh, in the Earth's orientation parameters the sources can have uh, structures. There is uh, an a priori unknown uh, atmospheric uh, contribution as well, with different contributions from the troposphere, and the ionosphere, and there are also instrumental delays due to the uh, different electronic path effects. So we have to correct uh, for all this, and uh, here you show. Uh, a small chunk of the data. We usually make these uh, uh, plots for a few minutes of data, one, two minutes. Uh, for now, please just uh, uh, look at the red and the green parts. Those are the uh, parallel hands. So you, uh, in the bottom, you see the, uh, the correlation uh, amplitudes uh, within uh, the, uh, the band, so the, with the uh, frequency. And in the upper uh, parts, you see uh, the visibility phase uh, uh, versus frequency. So these are just four uh, subbands uh, on the baselines uh, on the baseline Effelsberg noto. What uh, what you see is that the signal to noise uh, ratio is quite good. Uh, but you can also see that. Uh, Due to the shape of the filter we use for observations, there is a, a, a response function that uh, causes the, this uh, amplitudes dropping at the edge of edges of the band. So, uh, so that will be have to uh, be corrected for in bandpass uh, uh, calibration. You also see uh, that the phases uh, uh, change a bit frequency, and that will have to be uh, corrected for in fringe uh, fitting. And you can also see that the amplitude amplitudes uh, are given in just row correlation coefficients 
and those uh, will have to be uh, transformed to uh, real uh, flux densities in Jansky. So uh, this will be done during uh, uh, the data calibration. This is our calibration strategy. First of all, we apply the parallactic angle correction. So this uh, corrects for uh, feed rotation for altazimut uh, antennas. So the sky apparently rotates uh, over the antenna if you have, have an alt uh, azimut telescope. While uh, the equatorial dishes they rotate together uh, with the sky. You apply some a priori flag tables uh, if uh, available. And then uh, it's a good idea to look at the data. Sometimes you can uh, check plots available from the EVN archive, but you can also do some plots yourself. You identify some uh, bad subbands or bad antennas that may need flagging. At this stage, I would just suggest to do this very uh, coarse flagging of, of just bad antennas and uh, bad subbands. After this, you will do uh, the amplitude calibration. You apply uh, the system temperature measurements and the gain curves to set uh, uh, the approximate uh, flux scale of the observations. If you one wants to refine this, uh, it's only possible if you actually have measurements, simultaneous measurements of, of one of the calibrators with the connected uh, element interferometer array that has short spacings and with the help of uh, primary flux calibrator sources you can find uh, the flux density for your VLVI calibrator during the observations. The next step uh, we call manual, manual phase calm uh, and that means that we have to remove the, the delay and phase offsets between the, the, the subbands. So this is uh, uh, mostly the instrumental uh, delay uh, in the data. We want to remove this uh, because this is a, a very a simple step to remove uh, a, a delay factor that is uh, stable during the observation. At least it should be stable during the observations. But when you remove the offset from, uh, uh, from uh, in between the subbands, then later in fringe fitting you can combine all the all all these uh, subbands together, and uh, with the increased bandwidth you have a much uh, better sensitivity to look for. Or fringes. So after this uh, manual phase call, uh, you will start uh, fringe fitting where you uh, derive the residuals of delays, rates and phases uh, with time for the whole experiment and uh, typically use uh, solution intervals of 1-2 minutes at uh, gigahertz frequencies. And uh, as I said, uh, you will use the whole band for this. Uh, you always uh, fringe it only for the calibrators uh, and the phase calibrators and the solutions you apply for usually for all sources for the calibrators and the target as well. So this is what we call phase referencing and then the idea behind is that uh, because your uh, phase reference and target source are close to each other, it's in principle the same atmosphere we are looking uh, through and whatever uh, atmospheric phase fluctuations there are on short time scales, uh, those could be uh, corrected for uh, using uh, the phase calibrator source. When you finished with this, uh, you can do uh, a a bandpass uh, a calibration as well and we usually do this only after fringe fitting happens so this way we can separate uh, the phase uh, versus frequency uh, due to delay or due to the bandpass. 
when you finished with the with the uh, calibration of, of your data you, you applied all the calibration then you can start imaging so you start imaging your calibrator you start cleaning your dirty map iteratively and then you should always watch how the source model builds up you should look at the model visibilities and compare uh, uh, your visibilities to the data. In this, it's very relevant uh, to look at the, what we sometimes call rat plot, which is the amplitude uh, and phase versus UV distance uh, plot. When you start cleaning, it's usually uh, the longest baselines, the most compact parts of the source, uh, that are, are cleaned out first and there the model will uh, fit uh, the observations but the more extended uh, structure uh, you couldn't clean out yet so that means that there is a discrepancy between the short uh, uh, spacings of uh, data and the model it's important uh, that when you start self-calibration, so you take your models and uh, uh, calibrate uh, the, uh, the data with this model. Initially, you only calibrate for phase. You should only start uh, calibrating uh, your amplitudes as well when you have already uh, quite a good agreement between the short spacings model uh, flux and the, and the data. If you start amplitude calibration earlier, that means that uh, you may uh, lose a lot of uh, flux uh, due to this. So you do, you do this uh, iteratively in a few cycles. Now, if you cannot uh, uh, build up uh, uh, model, uh, enough uh, model flux, then if you, usually there is a problem and, and repeating a phase self-calibration imaging 8, 10, 15 times will probably not help. Then you should identify instead the problem. Maybe there is some bad data some, somewhere. Maybe uh, uh, one or more antennas uh, have uh, bad uh, initial amplitude calibration, things like that. So let's say uh, you imaged your calibrator and... Uh, and self-calibrated the data and you are happy now you have to apply this uh, calibration to the target source as well and now you can image your target if your target source is weak then you never do uh, self-calibration but if uh, you have very uh, good signal to noise ratios then you can also self-calibrate uh, the target data an important warning is that uh, when you are doing astrometry, then uh, you don't do uh, self-calibration on the target because uh, that way you will uh, modify the astrometry, alter the astrometry result. And you have made your image. Then uh, you can do detailed analysis of the results. You can model fit the data, for example, measure the size uh, of the most compact uh, components in your source. And then you interpret the results and, and publish your data. So congratulations. And I hope that uh, uh, you will succeed with all this uh, during the tutorials. I, I have just... Uh, a few more uh, words to say. I mentioned that this is a, a transitional per period, so the, the pipeline products are, are available for the APES Parcelton pipeline in the archive at the moment. But we, we are work, working towards uh, uh, producing Jupyter notebooks uh, for CASA as well. And in the future, uh, you should be able to download uh, a Jupyter notebook for the archive and apply that to your data and then. Uh, you could possibly uh, add your own things to this uh, notebook and then later uh, uh, upload it uh, to the EVN archives, uh, the archive and, uh, and help other users of the EVN this way. 
So this uh, this is in progress right now. And just looking into the future, of course, we are we are really looking forward uh, to use uh, antennas uh, from the African VLBI network and uh, later uh, the square kilometer array as well uh, to make some uh, to do some exciting uh, science uh, with the SCAR VLBI because uh, ultra precise astrometry is, is a really strong. Uh, science uh, driver for BLBI. For this, however, we will need uh, multiple SK beams, but but this is a story for for a different uh, presentation. And we are always here to help you. Please contact Jive if you have uh, further question. Thank you very much.